Well, good morning, everybody. For those of you on the West Coast, for those of you joining us uh, further east, good afternoon. And thank you for joining us for uh, our July webinar. Uh, as, as If you've uh, attended any one of our past couple of webinars, you know that uh, we have launched a, a monthly webinar where we're covering a variety of topics and themes. And in uh, our July webinar, we have our guest, uh, our CIO joining us, Matt Demetrison. We're really excited to dive into some of our thoughts around the economy, what's going on in the markets, how we're thinking about this uh, applying to portfolios, and most importantly, why does this matter to clients? How does this impact what it is our clients are setting out to achieve in terms of their goals and their outcomes? Um, if you joined us for one of our past couple, you, you know that we've talked about state planning. We talked about sunsetting uh, tax laws in 2020, at the end of 2025 and things to be doing that you could be thinking about now. We got into the basics of estate planning. And we are excited for our August webinar, which will happen earlier in the month. So it's just a couple of weeks out on August 7th. We'll be talking about uh, the Supreme Court's Connolly decision that affects business owners. And so uh, we'll have more about that at the end of this webinar. But for today, we're going to dive in to all things investments and markets with Matt. So, Matt, thanks for joining us. Before before I uh, you know throw questions at him and hopefully uh, you all will have questions for us as well. And to that, to that end, please uh, type in questions that you have. In the Zoom function, you'll see an, answer, uh, an area for questions and answers. If you type in questions there, I will be sure to weave those into our conversation with Matt. And if it doesn't fit in the middle of the conversation, we'll certainly leave time at the end to address those. Before we, before we dive into to the content for today, I think it's really important that we just pause and help everybody understand how we think about our relationships with clients. We really are uh, a financial planning focused firm um, uh, that does investments very, very well. And we believe that in order to optimize investment portfolios in a bespoke or customized manner for clients, it's really important that we first understand the goals and the outcomes that they're trying to achieve. And so you can see here on the screen the areas in which we're focused with our clients. And so, as I mentioned a moment ago, we talked about estate planning on a couple of webinars the last couple of months. We, we are uh, in tune with our client's tax situation that bleeds into everything we do for them from a financial planning, a cash flow perspective, and it absolutely uh, exists inside of our implementation of investment portfolios, trying to be tax efficient in terms of how we manage our client's money. Uh, we do insurance reviews, trying to make sure that we're helping clients manage their risk and making sure that they're not overinsured, uh, quite frankly. Uh, we also are helping clients, you know, focus on what is it that the, the legacy they want to live, they want to leave, and what's the impact they want to make beyond their livelihood here. And uh, at the core of all of that is financial planning. And so after we unpack financial planning with clients, which really is short form for understanding and getting clarity around goals, we then have the ability to give purpose to your assets or to your money, and that is where we get into investments. And so I'm really excited to have Matt here with me today. And so we're going to do our best to uh, make this a conversation that includes and invites you to join us in that dialogue. But to kick off the conversation, Matt, maybe we'll start um, with a question and you kind of then lead us from there and we'll see where this takes us. You know, over the past couple of years, it's uh, everybody has seen and everybody has talked about the Fed's, you know, raising of rates. I think they've gone up, you know, over five percentage points in those couple of years. Um, and we've talked about what does this mean to the economy? The economy seems to have been resilient. Words we've heard thrown out on you know, various media outlets is, will there be a sap soft landing? Uh, can the economy withstand the interest rates? And clearly they've re you know, with the economy has withstood the, the five percentage points of, of interest rate hikes. But now that that's where we're at today, where are we going in the future? And, and do you foresee the economy being able to maintain its strength uh, and what are some of the impacts going forward? Yeah, no, it's a great question, Nate, and thanks for the opportunity to answer it. So you're right. So beginning in March of 2022, the Fed started its rate hiking campaign and ended about this time last year where rates were up over five percentage points. And our view and, and pretty much every uh, economist out there had the view of you can't raise interest rates by 5% and not have a recession. And so the expectation was, hey, in the back half of 2023, 
there's going to be a recession. Employment's in a really good shape. It's not going to be a bad recession. It'll be a soft recession, but people are going to have to pull back. And what happened was the exact opposite. The economy grew stronger. We had GDP growth of nearly 4% in the third quarter of last year, just defying everybody's expectations. And so to kind of start answering your question of where are we going, we do have to kind of take a step back and say, well, why did this happen and, and where have we been? And so the two reasons why the economy kind of outgrew those expectations were consumer spending and the federal government spending. And so this chart on the left here shows personal consumption, and it kind of goes back to 2017, and you can kind of see this trend that we were on, and that's indicated by the dashed blue line. And obviously, we get, we get well underneath the trend during the pandemic, but kind of since early 2021, once vaccines started to come out, consumers have spent above trend, and they've done that because they've had excess savings from the pandemic, stimulus payments that went out, people just weren't going to, weren't traveling, weren't going to restaurants, so they saved more money. They're now spending that. So the, the San Francisco Federal Reserve actually calls this excess savings. They keep track of that. And their recent data kind of said consumers just recently in the last quarter have kind of finally run out of that excess savings from the pandemic. The other piece is consumers are just electing to save less. Historically, consumers have saved about 7 to 8% of their paychecks. Today, that's 3.9%. So they're saving about half of what they've historically saved. They're electing to kind of go out and spend more of that. And so that's helped support the economy more than people thought. And then the other piece is, is the federal government. And so this is from the Congressional Budget Office, kind of shows their federal deficit here on the right-hand side. We know deficits were higher during the throes of the pandemic when the government was kind of stimulating things to keep the economy afloat. But the deficit has kind of remained at an elevated level. It's about 7% of GDP. You know, pre-pandemic was kind of in the 2 to 3% range. And so extra federal government spending, spending, extra consumer spending has kind of kept the economy afloat. I think the VR view is that that probably the incremental benefit of further consumer consumption remaining at its level or increasing is unlikely. And same on the government side that we may still we're still likely going to run deficits, but it's likely to continue to grow. Um, and so as a result of that, we think the economy will start to soften. It doesn't mean it's going to go into a recession, but the rate of growth might start to slow. Um, and so here on the left, we have the Bloomberg Economic Surprise Index, and that just measures where does economic data come in versus everybody's expectations. Doesn't mean it's going down; it just means it's it's you know it's either above or below expectations. And that data kind of continued to exceed expectations through the first quarter of this year. And in the last three months, we've seen that data kind of surprise to the negative. And so you see this fall off in the Economic Surprise Index. Economy is still growing. In fact, we got GDP numbers today for the second quarter showing uh, you know U.S. GDP grow just under three percent. So the economy is growing at a good clip, but it's starting to decelerate. And so that, I think that's our expectation. The chart on the right is actually the Federal Reserve's kind of forecast of where the economy's kind of growth rate is going to go. That common growth rate is the gross domestic product or GDP. And you can kind of see it's kind of going to, you know, 2023 was maybe the peak, post-pandemic peak, if you will. Um, and it's just going to kind of continue to slowly grow slower. And I think that's our base view. And so when we sit there in an environment that's, you know, we're probably going to see higher rates for longer. They'll probably come down a little bit, but they're going to remain well above where they were prior to 2022. Um, and we're going to see a slower economy. We think that's an environment you want to be kind of more focused on higher quality stuff in your portfolios and be more attentive to the fact that the economy isn't growing as strong as it had been. One last piece I'll say is, and I think that's helped through this part of the cycle, um, is just every, there's a lot of the reason we didn't have as much pain um, with the 5% increase as well or a secondary factor um, is everybody refinanced their debt and was smart before uh, rates started to go higher. And so this looks at mortgage refinancing. Um, and you can kind of see in 2022, or sorry, in 2020 and 2021, about $8 trillion worth of mortgages refinanced. And so, yes, interest rates went higher, but when housing is about 40% of the average consumer budget, and their interest and their mortgage payment isn't going higher as interest rates have gone higher. That's allowed them to spend more. Does I think help the economy to weather this more so? And this similar thing happened actually in the corporate debt side. A lot of corporate CFOs, they're smart people, and they went out and they refinanced their debt in advance. So Matt, actually, on the slide before this, where you were making your comment about you know interest rates higher for longer, maybe they come down you know incrementally, uh, not precipitously, clearly in terms of all the indications we've been given. Will it, the question I have is, will it be enough for the economy 
to continue its pace? Or do you think even with rates coming down, you still see the deceleration continuing in the economy? Yeah, that's a it's a good question. Um, because we didn't really see the pain going on, the rates going up, we don't think they're gonna, there's going to be a lot of pain coming down. Um, and so there's not mortgage rates today, average mortgage rate is 6.8%. If the Fed cuts interest rates by a half or a percent over the next six to 12 months, maybe the average mortgage rate six percent, with most people still in that two and three quarter to three and three quarter range, they're not going to refinance their mortgage. I don't think it's going to spur uh, an acceleration in the home market. Um, so I don't think it's going to have a material impact on the economy. Got it. So with that as the backdrop, you know, let's now apply what we've just talked about to the stock market. What have we seen so far in 2024 with that as the economic backdrop? You've talked about, you know, the, the consumer. You've talked about, you know, the government, government spending. What is what have you seen now relative to companies and individual you know, stocks and what it's doing there? Yeah, no, it's been an interesting year um, in the market. And here I'm kind of showing just returns for the first half of 2024. Um, and it's been a very, what we would call a narrow market. We saw that same exact thing in 2023. There's this concept of the magnificent seven stocks, so the Apples and the Googles and the Metas and the Teslas and the NVIDIAs and the like that are really driving the market in 2023. That's continued into 2024. And so when you look across the different segments of the market, large companies or large cap stocks, which is what the S&P 500 measures, those are up 15% in the first half of the year. Within large companies, if you kind of segment that to companies that are not growing as much, but have a little cheaper prices, those are what we call value stocks. And then those stocks that are growing at kind of above average rates, we call those growth stocks. It's the growth stocks that have driven it. Growth stocks are up 21% in the first half of the year. Um, outside of that large cap, in particular, that large growth segment, the rest of the market has had okay returns, not bad on a long-term basis, but they're not necessarily as stellar. And so you can see here, small companies are only up 2% on the year. International companies are up 6% on the year in the first half of the year. So much more muted pace. What's been interesting in the market is that's really reversed here in the last couple of, uh, last couple of weeks, where we've really seen small cap stocks outpacing large cap by nine percentage points just in the last, uh, last couple of weeks or in the more in the month to date. Um, so we are starting to see a little bit of that reversal. If we dig deeper, I guess, in kind of that trend in the first half of the year, when you look at the S&P 500, there's 11 different sectors that make up that. So financials and energy stocks and technology stocks. Only two of those 11 sectors have actually done better than the S&P 500, and that's technology and communication services. Communication services is a broader swath. that will include a Verizon and an AT&T and a Comcast, but it also includes Google and Meta. And so when you look at that group of stocks, it's really only two of the 11 sectors that are driving the market higher, and it's more technology oriented. The chart on the right kind of shows only 10% of members of the S&P 500 are actually outperforming the S&P on the trailing 12 months. So it's again, it's that narrow, it's those magnificent seven stocks that happen to make up, when you look at the S&P 500, over a third of the index is in the top 10 names because the bigger have gotten bigger, they're a bigger weight in the index and they're the best performers. We expect that to start to broaden out. And the reason starting to being is the, the difference in growth rates between those magnificent seven stocks and the rest of the market is expected to start to compress as we get through the rest of the year. And so you get to the end of the year and those magnificent seven stocks as it stands today, and that can change, they're expected to grow at about the same pace as the rest of the S&P 500. And if you're paying a higher price for that, you're going to start to scratch your head and go, why am I doing that? Maybe I want to own some of these other things. And that's exactly what we've seen in the last couple of weeks is we've started to see some of those other parts of the market that have been left behind start to catch up. Um, and we've seen a little bit more of a broadening out of the market, which we think long term is healthy. So the VIX hit 18 yesterday, yeah. which is, uh, I, you know, it, that. Not far from an all-time high, but definitely elevated from where it's been. Yes. Uh, and a lot of that, I think, you know, comes as a result of what we're, we've seen with the, the Magnificent Seven. And I guess, so the question is, is this a precipitous fall for the Mag Magnificent Seven and AI-related stocks? Or is this something that, you know, slowly starts to level off and, and plateaus and, and, you know, maybe they incrementally grow over time? Talk about it a little bit about where we think both the Mag 7 go longer term and then ultimately 
the impact and who are the benefactors as the market broadens out. Okay. So it's important to when you put when you think about those magnificent seven and they all have slightly different businesses, but they're all largely tied to the artificial intelligence or AI theme. And so AI is clearly going to be a pretty significant innovation that's going to change our lives. You ask five people, five people are going to give you different answers as to how that really plays out. So I still think it's in the early stages, but there's been significant spending in it. So right now, there's roughly 200 billion of annualized spending just on building out AI infrastructure, whether that's the chips or the data centers or the like. So there's a lot of money going into it. And I think it's really started to excite people um, on that opportunity. And that's what started to fuel these magnificent seven stocks. Um, and so what you've kind of gotten is, is what we call from an investment jargon momentum of people start to get excited about that. So that leads to more people getting into the name and it starts to almost just like going down a hill on a bike. You get, it, gets, it gets momentum as it's going. And so I think we kind of hit this inflection point where people got maybe a little overexcited. It's not that AI is not going to happen, but maybe the expectation of it is going to be as immediate and as significant more immediately than it's going to be. And I think you're starting to see people walk back from that. And what's happened is now you start to see some selling that's leading others to kind of say, hey, maybe I should trim some of my portfolio back. There's a lot of investors that just follow price trends and they're starting to say, oh, that's rolling over. Let me sell out of this and move over. So it wouldn't actually surprise me if, if this trade continues a little bit longer and overshoots to the downside. Um, the flip side is when you look at these are great companies that have a ton of cash, you know, highly profitable, highly innovative companies. Um, you know, it's different than maybe the technology bubble of 25 years ago, where those companies weren't making money, they had negative earnings. And when things started to crash, they didn't, they were kind of left without anything. These are businesses that I think are going to be around for a while and have staying power. So we don't, you know, sit there and think the mag seven are going to go down 80%, like we saw in the tech bubble when things rolled over. Um, but you know, there could be a shorter term reset. I think that's healthy for the long term. These stocks have had a nice run. But they're also not, you know, each stock's different, but they're not like priced at levels where you go, that's egregious. Um, they're not going to grow into it. Matt, in uh, the spirit of uh, putting you on the spot, um, you were with a, a group of us, you know, having a similar conversation to this yesterday with all of our advisors, really, as we were yeah. diving into markets and economy and portfolios. I don't know if you remember the numbers you shared yesterday, but you talked about the AI numbers and the amount being invested yeah. relative to the return that we're getting. Do you remember those numbers? That Could you share yeah. those? Because I, I, I think a number of advisors said to me, that is a very interesting statistic that brings to life what you just talked about in terms of why this might slow for a bit and then have a catch up down the road. Yeah. So as I kind of mentioned, right now, we're kind of on a run rate of about 200 billion of investments into AI infrastructure. Um, OpenAI, ChatGPT's company, um, their annualized run rate is about three and a half billion dollars at the moment. They're by far the largest player in the space. Um, so if I do some just back of the envelope math and you add up how much Microsoft's getting from its co-pilot product and, and in Palantir's in the space and other companies in the space, maybe a ballpark say this 10 billion of revenue tied to AI but we're spending $200 billion of infrastructure. So that's not a great return on equity at the moment. And even, you know, to even pile onto that, we're in the middle of companies reporting their earnings results and uh, talking to one of the members of our team today. And, and he had commented that a lot of the, the, the um, technology companies are kind of saying, yeah, we may be overbuilding. We'd rather overbuild than underbuild. Um, but, you know, as we typically see in these cycles, there's excitement, people overbuild, and then there's this catch up period to, to when, the reality of usage catches up to the infrastructure. And I think we're seeing that at the moment. It's just a question of what is the magnitude and that's what we're trying to figure out. Yeah, Matt, that, I think, thank you for sharing that because I think and I'm, <laughs> I'm literally putting you on the spot uh, because I, we didn't, you know, this was not, this is not planned. So thank you. I'm glad you remember the numbers from yesterday. You know, I think as we think about this as advisors and working with our clients, I mean, we, I kind of feel like we're at the space of, you know, how long do you just continue to take your 50% 100%, whatever you, that significant gain is with NVIDIA, and, and I'm picking on one stock here, sure. but you could call it the Mag7, in hopes of getting another one, another 2% return before some significant, whether it's 5% or it's 10% rollover takes place versus, hey, let's take a few of these winnings. Let's not go below our base holding or target weight 
and maybe use this as an opportunity to get into some of these high quality, you know, strong cash flowing companies. They've got great management teams. You know, so I think that as we think about portfolios and we think about client outcomes, you know, we are focused on their goals. We're focused on their objectives. We're focused on what they're trying to accomplish. And I think oftentimes we can let sort of the hysteria of the market begin to cloud our thinking and think I've got to get one more percentage point or two more percentage points before I take chips off the table where you actually have some great opportunities right now to get into potentially where markets are going. And so as I talk to clients, that's one of the ways in which I'm helping them remember that, hey, our target return, if we get seven or eight percent, you're going to more than hit your goals. Yeah. And we've seen, you know, outsized returns if you've been in our portfolios year to date. So this is a great opportunity to sort of hit reset. Let's actually give ourselves potentially the opportunity for a better leg up in the second half of the year than maybe trying to eke out one one additional turn or two out of some of these long in the tooth AI companies. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but that's how I I've been talking agree. about it with my clients. No, I think it's a great, great advice. And great, I completely agree with it. So then if that's, if you know, so if we're on the same page there, you know, we talked about the broader economy, we've talked about the broader market, we've talked about the Magnificent Seven, where do we see or what do we see as, you know, being attractive on a go forward basis? And I, let's be clear, you're not saying sell all of these technology companies no. and go the other direction. No. I think what I hear you saying is like, let's get back to target weight. Let's get back to rational thinking. Therefore, there's got to be some other opportunities for us. And what do you see as we head into the second half? No, you're, you're spot on, Nate. And it's it's balance is kind of the way I think about it. Um, you want balance in that portfolio. We don't want to be leaning too far to the other. And as boring as it sounds, one of the areas we're actually getting more and more excited about is bonds. Um, and so, you know, here I chart this. is the So the, the Bloomberg aggregate index is like the S&P 500 of the bond market. It's what we kind of measures the broad market. Um, its yield is about five, it's five percent at the moment, or was five percent at the end of of June. Um, it's been in that range for about the past year, but prior to that, we hadn't seen five percent yields on bonds in fifteen years. And so, five percent return isn't you know you know isn't the greatest of all time. But to your point, native, we do seven to eight percent. That's pretty good. If you're getting seven five percent out of your bonds, you're making pretty good progress to that seven to eight percent. You don't need your equities to be up twenty percent to get there. Um, and so, and the other piece of bonds that's interesting, if, if you go back to the way bonds are priced, as interest rates go higher, the price of the bond goes lower. We're now on the other side of that. Interest rates, unless we see inflation go higher, there's a chance it could, but it seems less likely, maybe interest rates start to go lower. Now, I would say the bond market has priced in expectations of the Federal Reserve cutting rates. So if the Federal Reserve cuts rates at its meeting next week by a quarter of a percent, I don't know that the bond market moves a ton. But you've got this opportunity to say, well, if the economy softens more than we expect, and everybody expects the Fed now to cut more aggressively, I would expect bond yields to go lower and the prices to go higher. So you're kind of in an interesting environment where I get 5% of nothing kind of happens and it's dull. And if we have a recession or things go against us, I actually have a little bit of upside potential because yields could go lower, lower and prices could go higher. So it leads us a little more attracted to bonds. And not this is what I'm talking about is more in the taxable space. But if you look at municipal bonds, so those that are in higher tax brackets, so on a municipal bond today is giving you about a 3.7% yield. But if you adjust that for the fact that on that 3.7%, I don't have to pay taxes and say if on a tax adjusted basis, you're really earning 6.2%. That's pretty good for municipals where states and local municipalities are in really good shape. A majority of states now have, have actually have rainy day reserve funds. And that, didn't, that hasn't existed in 20 or 30 years. And so um, you're actually in a point where like the fundamentals are really good and you're getting a pretty reasonable yield. Um, bonds actually seem kind of exciting. Um, talking, getting away from just boring bond stuff. Um, another area we see some opportunities is actually in Japan. So outside of the U.S. So a very interesting thing in Japan, they've been in this period of economic malaise for about 20 or 30 years, really since the early 90s. They've started to see their economy start to improve. Inflation has not only gone from being deflation to positive inflation, which is a good thing for an economy, um, but they've started to see wages go higher. And so you can kind of see here wages are now tracking up 5%. People have more, more money in their pocket. It's higher than inflation. So on, a, on an inflation adjusted basis, they're actually earning more. 
Um, so their economy is starting to improve, which is which is a nice trend from where they've been in the last 30 years. On top of that, the, to uh, the Tokyo Stock Exchange has, has gone to companies. There's a lot of companies that have just been hoarding cash, not buying back stock, not paying dividends, and just seeing cash balances grow and grow and grow. The Tokyo Stock Exchange said to those companies, hey, you've got to come up with a plan of giving that capital back to shareholders, whether that's through share buybacks, whether that's through dividends. And you can kind of see in this chart, just in the last two, three years, you've seen a significant inflection higher. So you've got a better economy, better shareholder returns. You know what that's actually happened? Japan's the best performing market in the world in the first half of the, of the year, better than the U.S. even. Now, the challenge is, as a U.S. investor, is you've got to take your U.S. dollars, exchange them into yen, buy Japanese stocks. Um, and unfortunately, the yen has depreciated to the dollar. So as a U.S. investor, that return after you adjust for the currency adjustment hasn't been as strong as it would have been. But now we've actually seen in the last month, the yen started to uh, appreciate versus the dollar. And that's been kind of a nice trade. So that's an area in Japan that we've been, we've been constructed for some time on it, but we're really starting to see the fruits of that play out as we thought. I love it. Bonds are exciting again. <laughs> yeah, that sound boring, Nate. I'm, uh, I'm citing everybody, aren't I? Yeah, well, you know what's funny, though, is I think one of the things that can happen is if you think back, you know, six years ago and, uh, and then over that subsequent couple of years and you were highlighting in that slide and what I can't remember if it was 20 or 21 where people were refinancing into 2.75 or 3% and, and then people thought 3.75 was, was high and I missed the mark. And what I think what happened, you know, with a lot of clients was what was traditionally a client that maybe should have been in 60% equities and 40% fixed income became an 80% equity and a 20% fixed income client because the dividends that were being paid out of very high quality companies, they may not get the growth, but you could go to a Coca-Cola that would pay you three or 4%. And that was greater than what you could get in bonds. And the challenge you had in bonds, to your point, was interest rates at that point could only go one direction, which, which was up, which meant you were going to then lose value in that bond that you own. And now we have the complete opposite in terms of the bond environment that you just described. And I think one of the things we've been working really hard with our clients is to make sure if you really are a 60-40, 60% equity, 40% fixed income, that you're not still 80% equity and 20% fixed income with built-in unintended consequences potentially because of your equity exposure, where now we can actually take significantly less risk, but still have that opportunity for a bit of a buffer with a 5% yield on a bond and know that bond yields, if they're going to go any direction, they're probably coming down, which means the price, the value of your overall portfolio or ownership of that bond increases. And so I think it's good for us as advisors to make sure with clients, this is part of that ongoing rebalance, rebalancing process, not only out of, you know, let's just use NVIDIA or your, your, your tech company here because it's, it's overshot, but it's also thinking back over the last couple of years and maybe how your portfolio had shifted because bonds were not attractive. Phenomenal point, Nate. So, you know, I think it's important that, you know, as we think about it here at Miracle Mile, that it's not only the markets and the economy and the stocks and, and their performance, but it's how does this apply to our clients? And so, Matt, I think as a CIO, it's so fun to know that you are very invested in the client side of this equation in, in terms of how you help lead all of our investment decisions here. You know, so let's maybe shift gears a little bit um, with the market backdrop we've talked about. We've talked about interest rates. The other thing that a lot of clients have either started to, you know, add to portfolios, they've been reading headlines, and so they're, they've got questions about these areas. Maybe you could provide some color uh, from, a, from a client perspective, and what are the things we should be thinking about as it pertains to private credit and private equity? And if you could maybe give just a basic definition of those two things, just to level set for everybody in case someone's on this call and they, they're not quite clear, but they've heard it in the headlines. Um, and then dive into some of your thoughts. No, it's a it's a great and topical question. So private credit, it, the industry's really evolved in the last 10 or 15 years. And it, typically what would happen in the private equity space is what they call a leverage buyout. So private equity firm would come in and buy a company. They'd put, they'd finance some of it with debt 
hence the leverage in that buyout. And historically, they'd go to the banks, they'd go to JP Morgan, they'd go to Goldman Sachs, and they'd say, you know, we're buying this company for $2 billion, we need $500 million loan. And as a result of that, um, they, that, you know, Goldman Sachs would get, give them a loan, they wouldn't want to put the entire $500 million on, uh, on their balance sheet. Um, and so they'd actually what they call syndicate it out, they'd either go to other banks or other investors and say, hey, do you want a piece of this loan? Um, that market has pulled back significantly in funding private equity transactions. And as a result of that, um, we've actually seen more money in private credit funds. And so these raise money just like a private equity fund would, they'll raise a billion dollars and go out and fund a bunch of loans. Um, and so what's been interesting in that space is that's been better in a sense from than the leveraged loan market because each transaction, they can kind of customize how the terms of that loan versus the leveraged loan market is more commoditized. They want standardized terms. Um, banks have started to pull back on lending to private equity firms and leveraged loan market that really accelerated last year after Silicon Valley Bank went out. And a lot of banks just decided to hold capital, become more conservative. And so there's just the markets come more to the private credit market. And so there's just more demand for private credit that led to more attractive yields and returns. They've come in a little bit from where they were a year ago but you're able to make pretty attractive yields in private credit relative to what you would get in kind of the corporate bond market. On top of that, private credit, the fundamentals and the credit quality are pretty good at the moment. They can change. They are riskier loans. They're equivalent to a high yield bond. So there's going to be moments where there's going to be some challenges there, but default rates are at pretty low levels at 2%. Uh, in the private credit space um, and comparable to what you kind of get in the in the loan market. Um, so private credit is an area we find pretty attractive because you get pretty interesting yields with pretty good credit characteristics at the moment. And just the market dynamics have kind of moved in the favor of private credit. Um, again, these are more illiquid assets. And so they're not for everybody. If you can't handle if liquidity and not having daily liquidity isn't really suitable for you, that 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 makes sense. And, the, and these investments may not be appropriate. The other area is actually in private credit, and it's an area we're spending more and more time on as a team looking at. Um, this looks at kind of the multiples or prices paid um, on private equity transactions, uh, kind of going back over the last 20 years. And this is a multiple on using investment jargon EBITDA, which stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Put another way, it's the cash earnings operating profit you get on a business. Um, if you go back to 2022, at a point during 2022, um, private equity companies were tr trading at on a multiple of 13 times their EBITDA, as was public equities. Historically, public equities typically trade one or two times higher multiple um, than where private equity was at. So the fact that they kind of came down and were at an even multiple was an anomaly where you go private or public equity is actually pretty cheap. We'd rather own that than, than private equity. Since then, public equity multiples have gone higher as we've seen the market move uh, higher on strong returns in 2023 in the first half of 2024. Public equities now are trading at about 16 times. Conversely, as you can see on this chart, private equity is at 11. So you now have about a five point differential on private equity versus public. That's abnormally large. Um, and so you know, we, we look at that, see what we see out there for some opportunities in the market. And we kind of go, private equity is looking a little bit more intriguing today, especially relative to where public equity is at. And so um, there's some interesting things on the come. We think that could opportunities could kind of continue to get better uh, as the year goes along. So we kind of have the view of we're constructive on it. We think as you get through the year, there'll be more opportune opportunities um, to invest there. And so it's an area we're spending a lot more time looking at what's out in the market today in private equity. Again, private equity is similar to private credit. It's a liquid. It's not necessarily for everyone. And I guess maybe I'd throw it back to you, Nate, of, of you know, as a client, how do you think about if private credit, private equity is really right for you um, in your portfolio? Yeah, I think I think there are a couple of ways to think about this. There's, and I'll start with the wrong way first. Because it has become a headline topic does not mean that it is the right fit for you as an investor. I think it's imperative to you know, understand what private equity and, and or private debt for that matter in this broader bucket of alternatives can deliver for you as a client in terms of diversification. We should not be chasing returns in these areas. We should be looking for the value they bring from a diversification perspective 
to our broader portfolio relative to the goals and the outcomes that you as a client are in pursuit of. And if it helps increase the odds of you achieving those goals and outcomes through those investment returns, then it is a good fit for you. And I think for us, um, you know, we have, uh, you have done a great job in providing us with uh, there is no foolproof investment out there, right? There's nothing that doesn't come without some sort of risk. But the due diligence that you and the team are leading us through as an organization and, and all as a result of that, our clients are getting act, access to some of the best alternative opportunities that exist. Uh, and so where it fits based on our clients' goals and objectives in life, that, you know, that is what drives our decision in terms of including it in the portfolio as a, as a holding. And so uh, we look forward to the continued work that you and the team are doing in this area to, to benefit our clients. So before we sort of put you on the, on the uh, firing line where I'll jump into some topical questions, we'll get to elections and that sort of thing and sort of this round robin of questions at the end. Um, you know, one of our uh, listeners did have a, a question for us around private equity and credit investing as a um, potential, you know, avenue for cash flow. So could you talk a little bit about whether or not private e private equity or private credit is a good way to generate cash flow? Yeah, so private credit is uh, a, more of a cash flow uh, return asset. That's really where you're getting your return is kind of from those interest payments that come in. And so the returns tend to be more tied to floating interest rates. So effectively, they're going to move, the yields are going to move with movements in the federal funds rate. So as the Fed raises or cuts rates. So right now, I would say you're probably getting peak returns, at least for this part of the cycle. Um, but, you know, if the Fed cuts interest rates by a half a percent or a percent over the next year, it's not going to materially change the yield that you're getting. Um, but right now you're getting kind of high single uh, yield or high single digit uh, yields on private credit. Um, so it's an attractive income oriented asset. Private equity isn't as much. You own private equity more so for the, the appreciation in it. Um, and so that's not really something that's going to tend to provide as much income to a portfolio. So private credit, private equity, we talked about broader stock stock market, we talked about bonds, we talked about the economy. What's the playbook for the rest of the year? Yeah, I think it's, you know, we'll, you know, it's, it's every in market environment, there's always a bunch of risks. There's always a lot of risks today. We have geopolitical risks, we have election risks, we have the feds, the, the treasury still issuing a lot of debt. Can they get that off without a problem? Plenty of risks in the market. Um, I think as we look at it in a slowing or softening economic environment that's still positive, but softer, you want to be up in quality in your portfolio across the portfolio. So those would be equities that stocks that have less leverage, more predictable earnings power um, in the bond portfolio. You know, maybe you don't want to be owning as much uh, corporate bond or high yield bond exposure if you're not compensated for the risk. And I think we would look at levels today and say, you're not really compensated for that risk. And so in the public bond market, we've been trying to go up in quality. Um, and so, and then just in general, I think that balance in your portfolio to exactly what you've talked, Nate, about of not chasing necessarily those winners, there's obviously attractive traits with it. But as we've witnessed over the last couple of weeks, the, that rotation in the market can happen quick. You want that balance because you're invested for the long term. You're not invested for how July is going to be or how August is going to be or the next bounce in the market. You want that balance in your portfolio. And we are very focused on where that balance is in the portfolio and making sure we have it. So let's end with two questions. Uh, okay. First one, elections. Uh, you know, I the last five days has brought a significant change to what's going on in, in uh, the election in terms of the dynamics, in terms of the candidates. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of just election impact on markets and portfolios? Sure. So um, obviously you've got candidate Kamala Harris, who's new. So um, that's we're still kind of learning what her platform could be. I think the default view is it's probably more of the same in terms of the policies that have been put in place under the Biden administration. So that's probably good for more infrastructure. That's a big place they put things. I think there's talk of raising the corporate income tax rate to help fund some of the, their programs as well as manage the deficit. Um, if that happens, that's probably bad for all equities, not massively, but could be bad from that standpoint. Um, on that side of things, the Biden administration's tended to be pretty good for tech in general. Um, Harris comes from Silicon Valley. One would view that as maybe a good thing for tech. If you look at uh, Trump presidency, what would that be? Um, he's talked about uh, 
tax cuts. So that would be good for the market if that were to pass, especially in the corporate tax rate. Um, more tighter immigration policy. I think that could have an inflationary risk um, just because it, we are in an environment where we are lacking uh, the de labor participation rate is low. And so if that gets reduced further by tighter immigration policies, that could lead towards higher wage growth and that could be more inflationary. He's talked about drilling 3 million barrels a day more of oil. Uh, right now, the oil market's kind of at parity. Supply and demand are in balance. Um, that 3 million barrels a day of oil, likely if it were to actually happen, and I'm not 100% convinced oil companies would, are incented to drill at least at current prices, but if it were to happen, that would probably mean to lower oil prices. So one would think that's good for energy companies. I actually don't think it would be because I think the spot price or the price of crude oil would actually come down um, from that standpoint. And I think uh, obviously tariffs. Um, so I think that would have an that also would have an inflationary impact, um, but it also could be good, especially for uh, more industrial cyclical companies in the U.S. Um, as they start to take more share, um, just because they'll be at more pro a cost competitive advantage from that standpoint. So um, I think you know if you kind of summarize that, I would think a, a Trump presidency would actually be a positive for more of a broader market. Um, in, in that standpoint, I think a, a Harris presidency would probably be good for kind of a lot of the market dynamics staying in place. All that being said is some of those levers that the president can pull on its own, others such as the you know, uh, corporate tax rate that you're going to need uh, Congress on your side. And so then the other piece is even if it becomes clear one candidate's going to win or the, over another by October, um, I think it's still going to be pretty close in the House and the Senate. Um, and that's going to kind of drive to the magnitude that some of these impacts are going to be in there. Um, up until the last five days, and you pointed it out, Nate, the market's kind of been changing uh, with the changes on the Democratic ticket. The market had started to price in some of Trump's policies and a Trump victory into prices that's starting to get walked back slightly this week. So last question, we'll end it here. Um, one thing we didn't talk about, real estate. Ah, been a, yes. been a challenged a challenged uh, sector of our economy. Um, I don't know that all real estate is created equal, but you're definitely seeing you know residential prices come down. You've seen rents. I don't know if I'd say roll over, but for the first time in a while, start tick down in certain markets. Anyway, we hear all the headlines about commercial real estate. Um, any comments on real estate in terms of where it is and sort of its cycle and, and uh, you know, the challenges in front of, of that asset class? Yeah, I think the simple answer is it may be bottoming. I'm not convinced it is, but I don't think it's getting materially better in the short term. And the reason I say that is if you bought just the average commercial real estate property and you said it's spot on, Nate, not all real estate is equal. But if we assume that and just said the average commercial real estate property, the way prices are at today, you'd get about a cash yield of about five and a half percent on a private real estate property. If you finance that with debt, you'd have to pay somewhere between six and seven percent interest rates. So interest rates are higher than the cash yield you get just by buying it. And so you've had this slew of you haven't had a lot of transactions. The transactions you've had have been predominantly what they would call unlevered transactions where people are just saying it doesn't I can't put debt on the portfolio. It just doesn't make sense. And so that leads me to kind of conclude in the commercial real estate space, real estate investors are assuming interest rates come lower and come lower in a decent level. And so to buy to buy into real estate, you're either you have to assume that interest rates are coming lower or prices have more to drop further. Um, we'll see what the answer is, um, but it doesn't lead us to get that constructive to it. All that being said, a couple of years out, it could get kind of interesting um, because you have no new supply of new apartment buildings. All the ones that are being built were kind of in the works two years ago when real estate was more attractive. But there's not a whole lot of new development in the pipeline. And so as we get through 2024, you're not going to see a whole lot of new apartment buildings, a whole lot of new logistics centers being built. And maybe as we get into 2026, 2027, we actually get to a supply shortage. And so we're kind of constructive on real estate. If you take a long term five to 10 year view, if you take a one to two year view, I think we're a little bit cautious. Matt, thank you for your time uh, today. I really appreciate it. And more than anything, I, I appreciate your partnership in uh, working with us as advisors but also most importantly, your partnership with our clients and working on their behalf. So thank you for all that you and your team do. Uh, this was fun and we look forward to doing it again in a couple months. Uh, just as a reminder to everybody, thank you for your time. Thank you for your trust in Miracle Mile. 
Uh, and for those of you who are not clients but have interest in working with us, we'd love the opportunity to connect with you if any of this caught your attention. August 7th is a Wednesday, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific time. We will have our next webinar talking about the Connolly Supreme Court ruling, again, which impacts uh, business owners directly. So we look forward to uh, hearing from and seeing some of you again uh, in just a couple of weeks. Thanks again, Matt. Have a great yeah, rest right. of the week, everybody. Thanks,